All right. Good afternoon, Facebook family. Truly, this is the day that the Lord our God has made. The Bible tells us to rejoice and be glad in it. And so, y'all, we're grateful to be back with you all for Bible study. Uh, before we get started, we ask y'all to like our Encouragement Temple Ministries on Facebook. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube page and subscribe to our Instagram page. To give y'all some announcements, uh, mark your calendars. April the 14th, which is the second Sunday in the month of April, the Reverend Dr. Darrell Broussard will be our guest speaker as we celebrate our sixth church anniversary. God has been kind to us throughout this process, and we're grateful for all that the Lord has done for us. Um, this Sunday will be the first Sunday. Uh, we're in April, first Sunday. And so this is Communion Sunday. So for those of you who follow Encouragement Temple online, uh, do have your grape juice and crackers with you. Uh, for those of you who are viewing and you are in Houston, for the members, you come out um, and let us partake in those elements together. Um, keep these individuals in prayer. Continue to keep the Lazepo family and the Goosby families in prayer during their time of bereavement. Uh, continue to keep Brother Dennis's family and Sister Stewart's family in prayer. Um, and also, just pray for Encouragement Temple family as a whole. Uh, we've just come off the Daniel Fast, and we're grateful for that. Had an awesome experience this past weekend with the Good Friday service, and then we had uh, Resurrection Sunday. So we thank God for all of you all that's with us, Encouragement Temple. Again, this is our Bible study um, season that we're going through, our Bible study uh, session. We're going through the book of Hebrews at this moment. And so we're in the book of Hebrews, the chapter, 11th chapter, which is a familiar chapter one, one of the chapters that is so referenced in the church. Uh, and so this is our, our chapter of faith. Before we get started, let us pray. And after we pray, we will take off the lessons of on Hebrew chapter 11. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, God, we come. We thank you, God, for all that you've done. Father, we ask you in this season, God, that God to be magnified. We thank you, God, for keeping us, God, for being with us, for watching over us. Father, forgive us for our sins, God, that we've committed knowingly and unknowingly, God. Father, we ask you, God, to bless those who are connected to this feed, this virtual service tonight, God, those who will watch the replay. Father, open our minds and our hearts, God, that we can dig, God, and learn you afresh. And Father, we thank you right now. In Jesus' name, amen. All right. Again, for those of you who join us online, this is interactive. Let me know where you're viewing us from. Where are you located as we dive and dig into this lesson? God bless you. Pa Pastor Ross, God bless you. Uh, we're in Hebrews chapter 11. And so, let us get there. Hebrews chapter 11. Again, it's interactive. So we love your statements, your comments, your feedback. So let us know again where you're from and dive into this lesson with us. And so what we're going to do, I'm going to read the first three verses and we're going to dig into the lesson. The word of the Lord reads, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. For by it the elders obtain a good testimony. Another translation said, obtain a good report. By faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen are not made of the things which are visible. Amen. Let us, let us dig into this. He says, now by faith, right? Faith. This is basically the Christian definition of faith. It is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let's look at this word faith, right? The word faith gives us evidence of the invisible spiritual world. You cannot have faith apart from God. Uh, let's just get that. You hear a lot of people that say, my faith is huge. My faith is this. My faith is that. But if you don't have a relationship with our God, you cannot have faith to believe 
the things of God because the things of God is beyond the, the natural aspect of life. It is a supernatural understanding, meaning that, right? Meaning that when you have faith, you believe the impossible. You believe things that the natural mind says cannot be done, will be done, right? So in the instance, individual with AIDS the doctor says there's no cure for AIDS but a believing in God has to have faith and believe and I don't want to go too far in the lesson but have to believe that God is a healer that God can deliver that if he the same God back then that he's the same God right now right now and if he was able to heal the uncurable then he's able to heal the incurable now what you mean by that, Pastor? Well, if you know your Bible, leprosy, right? Leprosy, there was no cure for leprosy. Let, yet, the Lord was able to heal individuals of leprosy. If he's able to do that, we have to have the faith to believe that he can do it now. Not saying he would do it, because you've got to also have that, that the, the three Hebrew boy type of faith, right? That if he doesn't heal, then you, your testimony won't waver, right? He says, oh, now, faith is the substance, this substance, right, of things hoped for. Well, look, look, and the thing, of, if you have the substance before you can see it, then why do you need faith, right? It's like individual with, that has a $400 light bill. I pray that nobody has a $400 light bill. But if you have a $400 light bill, but then you have 500 in the bank, you don't need the faith because you can handle it yourself. You see it. But it's when you have that type of bill, you have, you don't have no money coming in, but you just believe that by the time that the cutoff notice come or before they cut you off, that you'll be able to pay that bill. That's the type of faith, faith you have. The sub things of things hoped for, but not seen. I don't see how I'm going to make this payment. I just believe by faith that it's going to happen. And this is the thing, right? Faith. Faith is not just a bare belief, right, or intellectual understanding. It's a willingness to trust in and to rely and to cling to what the Word of God says. It's not just a bare belief or something intellectual. It's, it's beyond the human mindset, right? It's beyond what we've been to school for. It's beyond what... We've been taught in seminary, what we've been taught in Sunday school, what we've been taught in BTU, YPWW, however what facet that you've had, and whether you're in the Baptist church or the Pentecostal church, it's beyond that, right? It is a willingness after all the teachings, after everything you learn, to trust in God's word, to trust in him, to believe that he is who he says that he is, and he's capable of doing everything that he says. He says, for by it, the elders obtained a good report. Hmm. Let's, let's think about this, right? Now, the elders that he talks about, the Hebrews, he talked about the elders of the Old Testament, right? And what I love about those elders who obtained a good report is like a lot of them, they all had different circumstances. They all had different personalities, right? In spite of all of that, they had this one thing in common, and this one thing was faith. And it's almost similar to us today in our walk of lives, those who are connected with church members or, 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 or so forth, right? We all have our own personal difficulties. Each one of us, we have our personalities. When you come into Sunday morning service and your worship opportunity, no, we don't look the same, right? Sister Bowleg ain't gonna look like Sister Jack Leg. Um, you may have this person with a degree, this person that's uneducated. It doesn't matter. Everybody have their own set of problems, whether some have it uh, uh, from a personal standpoint, professionally, financially, emotionally. You all have your issues. But at the end of the day, the one thing that we have in common is we're trusting that God can sustain us. And then right there he says, for the elders those before us. And even though we're talking about elders in the Old Testament uh, sense, we have elders, we have testimonies even now of the older saints making it through. 
some of y'all can attest, I remember hear, hearing the testimonies when I was a child of the old women saying that um, they didn't know how they were going to get their next meal and they trusted God and God sent somebody to fill up their, fill up their refrigerators, right? All of that was instilled in us as a child when we heard those from the elders, how some of them had sicknesses and God healed them, how some of them uh, couldn't walk, but God healed their bodies. They was able to walk. And now some of us, now we are elders and we can testify the fact that I was once young, but now we're getting older. I'm not going to say I'm old, y'all, but we're getting older. And we can say now, yet I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed beg for bread. We have those testimonies because now, if you're like me, you have adult children. And so now you're becoming an elder and you're setting that example. And you can testify to the fact that I got something that I didn't deserve. That's because of God. And I had my faith in him. Um, that job I applied for that they said I couldn't get because I was underqualified. Um, God allowed me to obtain a job for by faith that elders obtained a good report. And so it's for us now that we are becoming entering the season of being an elder that we obtain that good report by trusting God and believing that he's able to do the impossible. But he said, by this faith, we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God so that the things that we see are not made of things that are visible. Watch this. We, 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 we didn't see the act of creation, right? But by faith, we believe in you saying, Pastor, how we believe it? Because we're here today. We're part of that creation. We was not here, but by faith, we believe that God created and formed, spoke the world into existence, right? And then created and formulated, formed man by, with, by his hands in the image and the likeness of God. By faith, we believe these things. By faith, we believe uh, 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 that Christ died and he rose. We celebrated Resurrection Sunday. That's only by faith that we're able to to believe that he woke up on that Sunday morning with all power in his hands, right? Now watch this. This is I did some, do some reading. Uh, and most scientists at the time of the book of the Hebrews was written believed the universe was created out of existing substance, not out of nothing. They believed the world was made out of things which were visible. And that's why the Hebrew writer had to to. A, a rebuttal their 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 belief system because they was teaching that to the Hebrews. Remember, I informed you all that the Hebrew writer wrote to a group of Hebrews who wanted to go back to Judaism, and so he's reminding them of this greater faith that we have. And so, in this uh, uh, Hebrew level, which we call the Hall of Faith, he have to readjust their thinking and to remind them that the teaching that they believed in was false. And so that's why he, he informed them that, look, that's why he made this statement, that we believe this because I know what the Hebrew scientists were teaching, but that's wrong. Almost like today, you know, you have Scientology that's teaching that humanity, we evolved from apes and things of that nature, basically uh, denying what the Bible says, but we have to have enough faith again. And we're faith in our word that we know that God formulated the earth with his spoken word and he created man in his image and in his likeness. And so now when we transition to verse four and here on out, God begins to give us these examples of these great men and women of God who exhibited great faith. And y'all will learn some things as we dig into this about them having great faith because we've always placed a lot of them or most of them on having total faith. Reality is a lot of them have flawed characteristics, right? Uh, some of them didn't, but some of them did. Again, for those of you viewing online, it's interactive, so leave your statements, your comments, your questions, and when it pops up on the feed, I'll do my best to uh, acknowledge your statements and your questions. All right, verse 4, he says, By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, through which he obtained witness that he was righteous. God testified of his gifts, and through it, he being dead, still speaks. Wow, right? Wow. And so here it is. Here it is.
He says, for by faith, Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice. Now, let, let's dig into that, right? Because as a child, Christopher Bless, thank God for you. We thank you for your words of encouragement. And we will continue to lift you up in prayer, man of God. Um, let's look into this. Because as a child, I was always, we were taught that reason why God accepted Abel's sacrifice above Cain is because Cain was one of the fields and he gave, it was a field thing and he dealt with the animals, right? And, and so, and so we taught, we was taught that, but as we take a deeper look into Genesis four and three, we learned that it was not between animals and vegetables, right? What do you mean? We're gonna, I'm gonna read that real fast because as some of us taught as kids, since Cain was out there in the field, he should have offered an animal and Abel because of the individual he was should have offered up, right? He should have offered, um, he should have offered a vegetation, but that's far from the truth. Let's read this, read this, right? We'll read Genesis 4, 3 through 5. He says, he says, and in the process of time, it came to pass that Cain brought an offering of fruit of the ground to the Lord. Abel also brought of the first born of his flock and of their fat, right? And the Lord respected Abel and his offering, but he did not respect Cain and his offering. And Cain was very angry and his countenance fell. So what is the difference? What is the difference? Well, the difference is, I'm glad you asked, the difference is, is that Cain just offered a sacrifice. Abel gave him the firstborn, the first fruit. So in retrospect, it was never the animals. It was never just the veg ve vegetables. It was the mindset, right? Abel says, before I do anything with my offering, and well, I'm saying this is, this is, let me say this straight. This is Pastor Reed's processing, right? This is not Bible. This is Pastor Reed processing. He said, before I take mine from the top, I want to give God my very best. I mean, it says it in the text that Cain offered fruit offering. Abel gave him the firstborn, the best of the best, the best of the best. That's why when we talk about tithing and giving, it says, Give to God the first fruit. Basically, before you take yours, you give to God. And it, it is clear in the text. Cain gave. Abel gave first born. And so what leads us to, to us to understand that Abel trusted God so much that by faith I would give God my firstborn, understanding that God gave it to me. I'm grateful for it. That applies today, right? A lot of us, we 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 do we, honestly, some of us, we don't give God our first fruits. Mm, uh, we give God what's left over. Abel said, before I dig into it, I'm going to give God what's due unto God. By faith. And that's how we are. Things can get tight, but by faith, you know, we say, God, I know that my bills are tight and things of that nature, but before, I'm going to always give you yours and just trust that you're going to meet me the rest of the way. And that's a beautiful thing. And that's something that we need to practice, you know, because it's one thing to give out of your last. And it's a, it's a whole another thing to give out of your first and then working with the wet, with the rest. And that's why he says that Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice because it's something about giving God just from the top. He said, God testifying of his gift. How did God testify of his gift? Well, God testified of his pleasure with Abel's uh, sacrifice by consuming it with fire from heaven. God said, you know what? I'm going to show you, basically, I'm pleased of what you've done. And yet God is not consuming our sacrifices like that, but God blesses you when you give your first fruit and God meets all of your need. God answers your prayers. God keeps you in good health. It's because we put God at the forefront of everything. And, and because of this, through, through it, 
he being dead was still speaking, right? Because what the writer wanted them to understand, right, is that you'll be rewarded on earth. Sometimes your reward will of your sacrifice will happen sometimes after death, right? Think about this, that mother who's been saved for a long time, child been out on the street praying to God to save their sons. God promised them, promised her that he will save her son. She might have, some, she may have died and the son received Christ three years after she died. But the word of God still was a fact. God said he was going to save her and he saves her because the woman would continue to sacrifice, continue to live unto God. Mm. Mm -hmm. Right. Wow. And so verse, 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 verse five, verse five. By faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was not found because God had taken him. For before he was taken, he had this testimony that he pleased God. Verse six, which we all know, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. For he who comes to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. Mm, mm. By faith, Enoch, by faith, Enoch was taken away and he did not see death. So th th this goes back to Genesis, right? And so this individual walked with God had a relationship so knit with God and was pleasing to God that Enoch did not die. That Enoch was scooped into heaven. Let that sink in. With his own record, two individuals did not taste death. We all know about Elijah, right? Because he was the great prophet. But we also have record, you know, the first one was Enoch that he pleased God, he sacrifices, he lived for God, he trusted God, and by faith, he did not see death. Mm. Some of us, I know we would love that testimony that by faith we don't taste death, but the reality is we have to believe God and have that type of faith until the end, but what I love, he says, but without faith, it is impossible to please God. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. And so you have a lot of people that say, oh, Lord, I want to, God, I want to please you. I want to please you with my life. God, I want to please you with how I live and how I move. Well, if you're trying to please God apart from faith, it's impossible. It's right there in scripture. Without faith. So if you're a person that, that does not have faith, you will never be able to please God. Because the word of God said it's impossible. He said one must believe that he is. What, 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 what is that he is? We got to believe that Jesus Christ is our Lord and Savior. You got to believe that he died on Good Friday, that he rose on Resurrection Sunday, that he sitting on the right hand of the Father, and that through him is salvation. You got to believe that he's that individual. And not only that, you also have to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him, right? And so how, that's a deep thing. He says, diligently seek him, meaning that every day you're striving to seek God. You're, you're, you're almost taking on the testimony of Paul that I may know him in the power of his resurrection. Fellowship of the suffering. Man, conformable unto his death. That's diligently. You, 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 every day, you are waking up saying, how can I get closer to God? You have to diligently put in the time. Diligently dig into the word. Diligently. Because what we got to believe, we got to believe that he's there, right? And that he will reveal himself to those who are seeking his heart. got to believe that he's there and he will reveal himself to those who are seeking his heart but then I like I preach on Sunday but then you got to recognize when he's revealing himself to you 
in his life. Wow. Wow. Verse 7. Let me say the character of God and the fruit of the Spirit. Elaborate on that, uh, Sister Booker. He says, verse 7, by faith Noah, being the violent one of the things not yet seen, moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household, by which he condemned the world and became heir of the righteousness which is according to faith. And so the next individual we talk about is Noah, right? Being the vilely one of things not yet seen. What do you mean things not yet seen? Well, you got to understand that God tells Noah to build this ark because it's going to rain. Now, prior to that, rain has never fell. Water came from the ground to water the, the earth. Nothing prior to that point, the water did not come from heaven prior to um, Genesis 7. And so, so Noah had to prepare an ark for something that has never happened before. How many of us will do what God said and it's something we've never seen before? Noah didn't know what rain was. That was a new terminology. Rain, ship, water from heaven. God tested his faith. I need you to build this ark because it's coming. And Noah, according to scripture, we couldn't find anything else, took God at his word and began to build. If God is telling you something, you have to take God at his word and continue to move in it. And we may not see it, we may not understand how to process it, but trust God, things will move forward. But Noah, again, he trusted God, was warned, divinely warned. And his, his faith believed that there will be a flood. The flood will come. And the Bible says he moved with godly fear. And that's the thing, godly fear, godly reverence, believing God will do what he said. And I don't see it. I can't understand it. I can't process it with my finite mind. But God, if you say that this is going to happen, then I have to trust and believe. And it's a lot, and uh, there's a thing by faith, y'all. And it's a common thing. You have to trust and believe that it will happen. And you may not know how. You may not know when it will happen. God still does the impossible. God still does things that we have not seen, maybe in our lives, right? We just got to believe God. It says that he condemned the world. Because at that moment, if you go back to, to, to Genesis 6, the Bible says that the son, that the, the daughters of men were cohabitating with the sons of God. And so, Noah... God destroyed the wind and Noah by faith, right? Watch this, watch this. And this is what sticks out about Noah. Noah didn't hear no preaching, right? Noah didn't have Bible study. He didn't have no virtual Bible study. Wasn't no revival going on, right? That preached the word of God. And Noah, Noah believed. Yeah, you know, we had service on Sunday after Sunday. When Bible study, uh, we have Bibles, Good Friday services. We have all of this. And then some of us, we just don't believe God can do the impossible. So the question becomes, then why, why, why are we going to all of these services? Either you trust and believe God or, or some of you are you just doing it out of a routine. If you're doing it out of routine, it's not a good thing, right? You just got to believe who God is. All right, verse 8, verse 8. We transition that we are about to talk about Abraham, right? Verse 8 says, by faith, Abraham obeyed when he was called to go out to the place which he would receive an inheritance and went out not knowing where he was going. So Abraham, when God called Abraham, Abraham stepped out on faith and going 
to the place God had promised him, right? But you got to understand this about Abraham, right? Is that Abraham's faith was not a perfect faith, right? And we're going to talk about a little bit further in a little. Abraham, in his process and in his dealings, he, he, he was not perfect in his actions. And, and that's the word for a lot of us, you know, you, we're not perfect beings as long as we housed in his flesh, you know? Sometimes it's okay to say, God, I don't believe, help my unbelief. Because God, I want to be pleasing to your sight. But the thing about Abraham's faith is when God told him to go, he went. He went. Now we, we, we learned that there are some things on this journey, right, that that he, he, didn't, he didn't excel in. But there were some things that he did anyway. So look at verse 9 and 10. By faith he dwelt in a land of promise as in a foreign country, dwelling in tents with Isaac and Jacob, the heirs with him of the same promise. For he waited for the city which has foundation, whose builder and maker of God. So basically right there, Abraham, what he did, he lived as a sojourner in the land that God promised, right? He never owned anything, right? He never owned anything except the plots that he and Sarah would bury. Now, God promised, and this go back to what I stated earlier, God promised, God can give you promises, but you won't see the promise, right? Some of us may not be allowed to see the promise. God promised Abraham this land. He was on the land, but at that time, all he owned were plots where him and his wife were buried. But he had to believe, right, that he just believed that God would would, would, would do what he says. Now, again, as we stated earlier, it was not a perfect faith, right? He wasn't perfect, but he still believed God. And the Bible say he dwelled in tents. He had no permanent residence. You know, he didn't have a place where he can go to every day. He was in a tent. And in those days, in tents, you moved around, right? He was he was a, he was a traveler, a sword, a sojourner. He was a, he was on the move consistently. But in his moving, what I love is that he looked forward to a better place. He looked forward to a better place. in his moving. He still looked forward to God for, to God to open the door. He looked forward to God to make the way, right? And 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 that's a lot of us we when we move every day, we it, it may be a struggle sometimes, but even in our moving, we we gotta move looking forward for things to get better. It may not get better tomorrow, it may not get better next week, but we have to continue to live to move forward and expecting God to 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 allow some things to get better in our, in our lives, whether it's your finances, uh your job status, your faith. You have to believe your health. Your marriage, you have to believe that God will allow things to look better. So we got to move. Yeah, oh, that's good. I like that, uh, uh, Dr. Witherspoon. Move looking forward for a better place. That's what it says in the scripture. You got to move. Now, we talk about the imperfect faith. We're going to talk about Sarah's faith and his results. And this is where things begin to get a little imperfect, right? But let's read about it first in 11 and 12. But by faith, Sarah herself also received strength to conceive seed as she bore a child when she was past the age because she judged him faithful who had promised. Therefore, from one man and him as good as dead, he were born as many as the stars of the sky and the multitude innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. Now, they say Sarah by faith, but we understand like Sarah faith, her faith was not perfect. Y'all got to remember that when God told her this, at first, she laughed in unbelief. That's Genesis 18, right? Because at that moment, she felt like she was too old to bear a child. It's impossible. She didn't believe God could do. She believed God could do certain things. But by her laughter, she didn't believe God can work within her anatomy, right? And so she laughed. How can this be? God don't understand my body is not made for that, that my body can't handle that. The Bible said at her old age, she received strength to, con to conceive the seed, right? And the boy, a child past her age. But think about this, not only bore the child, but to nurse, yeah, this is deep. She had to nurse this child to a certain age. 
And so God had to do a new thing within her body. And pause right there. You're, you're never too old for God to do some to do some workings on the inside of you. Um, I know we talk about Sarah in the natural sense that God was able to revamp her body, that she was able to produce milk, that she was able to nurse her baby to a certain age. But even for us as children of God, you're not you're not too old for God to rearrange your insides, to change your mindset. I know we as you get older, we have this 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 phrase. I'm stuck in my ways. No, that's if we allow the spirit of God to work on the inside of us, God can change that inside of us that we're no longer stuck in our way, but we're constantly evolving. We're constantly changing. We're my, my wife likes this word that you, you're constantly growing. You're learning. You're growing. You're moving forward. That's inside changing, right? He says, but then he said, therefore from one man in him as good as dead, Look, here the scriptures get real, real, real blunt about it. At that moment, one who was dead, that relational aspect was at a minimum, right? That, yeah, y'all can translate that. I won't go too deep into that. But he was dead, but God worked on him to revive some things in him that he was able to perform and able to do what he had to do for God to do what he had to do. We're going to leave that as that. And through that, God allowed him to produce that one child. And that one child became that, 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 yeah. And so God allowed him to be able to do that and to be able to God, God, God can, God, that's good. That's good. Right? God can resurrect some things that we thought was dead in our lives. A lot of people, they, you, prime example, I hear people say that, you know, oh, I, I'm too old to that, leave that to them young folks. No, God can resurrect you and, 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 and strengthen you because that's still more work for you to do. That's still more ministry for you to do. You still can go out there and witness. You still go out there and preach. You still go out there and show the young folks, look, God can revive and strengthen me for the work that's ahead. Mm. All right, verse 13 through 16. Now, this is getting very good again. This is interactive. Leave your comments and your questions and your statements. 13 through 16, he says, these, this is important. These all died in faith, right? Not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland. And truly, if they had called to mind that country from which they had come out, they would have had opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared a city for them. Mm. All right, and so that, that, that gives us, that takes us back to our next statement, right? He said that these all died in faith, not having to receive the promise. A lot of y'all probably was like, Pastor, why you keep saying we may not be alive? Well, this is why, because Abraham, Sarah, they, Abraham, they did not see uh, their descendants, right, outnumber the stars in the sky. They didn't. They didn't. They didn't live to see that. But they believed, not having received it. And that's why I go back to the one, the mother who prays for their children and good grandchildren to know the Lord Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. Some of these individuals may not live to see their children saved, but if God told them that they will be saved, then you have to die in the faith, believing that God's word is going to save my children and believe that God will save them. Whether it's in your lifetime or that, and we, a lot of us, we say that, right? I may not see it in my lifetime, but rest assured it's going to happen. If God says some things, if God says some things about your family, if he says your family dynamic will change for the good, and you have to say, I may not see it, but I believe it's going to happen. I believe it's going to come to pass. If I'm here to see it, I get to testify of the glory of God. If I'm not here to see it, God is going to be glorified because it happened. That's how we have to live. That's how we have to move. He said, look, this is deeper than just that, right? The promise of the Messiah was made 
for Abraham and Sarah, and they believe in the promise. But they only saw this in faith. Mm, they only saw this in faith. Faith is important, y'all. We have to continue to hold on to our faith. It says that they, they, they seek a homeland. They desire a better, a heavenly country, right? And I think the thing for us, I believe that for us, it's easier to live by faith when we remember that this world is not our home. It's easy for us to live by faith when, we're, when we remember that if we, could, if, if we accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, that this is not our permanent place, that this is only a temporary location, that we have a permanent home, which is in heaven. And so that's how we have to move. That's how we have to believe. And the Bible says, therefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God. A lot of us, we allow circumstances, right, to remove us from our faith, and we question God. But the real testimony that we show is continuing to believe and trust God throughout the hardships and the pain, right? Think about these, these individuals who we're about to talk about, who we're talking about now and we're going to talk about later. They had to trust God in tough times, right? You have to trust God in tough times. It's easy to trust God when everything is going well. You know, your five, six figure job, your, all your family is well, your husband is doing well, your kids are great, everything is going well. It's easy to, to, to scream and testify that I have faith. But how many of you are willing to have faith when it doesn't seem like things will change, when it doesn't seem like the need will be met, when it seems like that you're at the last minute and, 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 and it looks like that it is impossible by faith it's impossible to treat and please God but you got to believe that that with that with God nothing shall be called impossible even at the very last minute and so he says here verse 17 through 19 is the word of God he says by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promises offered up his only begotten son, of whom it was said, and Isaac, your seed shall be called. Concluding that God was able to raise him up, even from the dead, from which he also received him in a figurative sense. Now, I love this because this reminds me of a message that Pastor Chris preached, right? He says, by, by faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac, and he who had received the promise offered up his only begotten son. Now, what I love with Pastor Chris, when she preached, she said, hmm, that, it, that, that Abraham had another son, right? But it wasn't his promised son. It was, it was the son that God had promised that the seed would come from. And it says in the text that Abraham believed that God would raise him from the dead. That's a powerful statement in itself because what that is signifying is if you go back to Genesis chapter 21, Isaac says, God, we see the, got the wood, we see the altar, we got everything, but where's the sacrifice? Abraham covered his son and said, God will provide a sacrifice for himself, right? But at that moment, and then you correlate that with the text that we're reading today. It basically says that if Abraham would have went through with the sacrifice, Abraham believed that his son would rise from the dead. Okay, you say, Pastor, how does that relate to us? Okay, well, you have to believe. And it's tough, and I get it, it's hard. But you got to believe that if you got laid off from your job, you did everything right. You got laid off from your job. You just got to believe if he does that, then God has something better in store. That God is going to give me something else. He's going to resurrect that other aspect in my life. And that's how Abraham was. He was like, well, if God is able to do that, I believe he's going to raise him from the dead. But he couldn't do that because, because then it would have put him in a position of a type of Christ. And so God, at the moment that Abraham was about to sacrifice, he said, oh, oh. Now he know without a shadow that, that he 
that he feared God, that he, he reverenced God. But Abraham was ready to do it to say, you know what? If this were God's requirement, and if God said, my seed go come through you, it can't come through you while you're dead. Wow, right? So if God told you something uh, five years ago, something to do that, you got to believe God is going to allow that things to come to fruition, even if some things changed in your life. You just got to hold on to that, right? And he said what? He was concluded that God was able to raise him up from the dead, which also is a figure that said, we, we just got to believe that God is that type of God. Well, that's good. You got to go from believing to, yeah, that's good. You got to go from believing to knowing. You know, it's one thing to believe, but it's another thing to know, right? And if and this is the thing. Abraham, Abraham, right? God already had, did some things on the inside of him to be able to birth Isaac. And so in Abraham's eyes, if God was able to do that, God is able to do this as well. Oh, that's good. Verse 20. For by faith, Isaac blessed Esau and Jacob concerning things to come. Now, this is where we look at Isaac, right? When Isaac blessed, Isaac was actually really in the flesh, right? Because he first intended to bless Esau instead of Jacob, right? He, he Think about that. He was in the flesh. He, he, he didn't come out and just say, oh, Jacob, uh, 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 I'm going to bless Jacob. No, his old intent, his intent was to bless Esau, who was the oldest. But God had did some things that he wasn't able to recognize it because what Isaac would have done is he would have blessed Esau first if he if he could do anything about it. But yet yet Isaac came to the place of faith when he discovered that he had actually blessed Jacob, right? Instead of Esau. After the fact, he got to the place. He said in so many words, it's already been done. I'm paraphrasing. It had already been done, right? So when Isaac trembled exceedingly, he was troubled because he knew that he had tried to box God in and to defeat, to defeat God's plan and that God had beat him to the punch. Because, again, Isaac plans, y'all, this is about to bless y'all, was to bless Esau because of tradition, right? But God set some things in motion that sometimes will supersede tradition so God perfect plan can be can can go forth right God does that even in our lives I know some of y'all y'all know y'all wanted to do some things and and God allowed things to happen so that things that you thought you was gonna do wouldn't happen that's God changing some things that's God moving some things around in your life right and so, verse 21, y'all, this is getting real good. He says, by faith, Jacob, when he was dying, blessed each of the sons of Joseph and worshiped, leaning on the top of his staff. And so watch this. And so as Jacob was dying, right? You got to remember, you say, why was Jacob on the staff? Well, you got to remember in Genesis 32, uh, Jacob wrestled the angel wrestled with the Lord and Bible said that he touched the hip of Jacob and Jacob from that day forward walked with a limp. He had to walk with a cane. And watch this. Watch this. Jacob wasn't like you and I, Christians. No, Jacob lived a rather carnal lifestyle. He just lived a regular life, right? But, 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 but even in Jacob, his faith could also look that beyond his death, right? The Bible said he blessed each of his sons. He had, he had blessed each of Joseph's sons. He had to lean on his staff, use all his weight, holding himself up, blessing these sons. And he blesses just as what Isaac did with him and his brother, he understood God's purpose. And instead of blessing 
Joseph's oldest son with the double blessing. He blesses Joseph's younger son. And it's in Genesis uh, 49. Joseph goes to his dad and says, you're doing this all wrong. Jacob said, no, this is the will of God. Because what Jacob was able to do, Jacob was able to see that sometimes God works outside of our, our, our humanly traditions. Watch this, by faith, 22, verse 22. And then this is the hall of faith. By faith, Joseph, when he was dying, made mention of the departure of the children of Israel and gave them instructions concerning his bones. Oh, let's let that sink in, right? Joseph, when he was dying, and we talk about verse uh, 50, right? Genesis 50, 24. This is that he says, God will surely visit you and bring you out of this land to the land of which he swore to Abraham, to Isaac, to Jacob. Watch this. In his dying day, you got to remember where Joseph was at this time, right? Joseph, second in command in Egypt. Joseph held in his spirit and understood that God is a God that could not lie. He says, I, God, will give you this land. And when God, and he basically said, and I won't be around to see it, right? He gave them instructions, basically saying, when y'all leave, take my bones with you. Now, that's faith on deathbed, right? That's deathbed faith. He says to the people, when I die, and when I'm going to die, but when God visits you, when God delivers you, take my bones with me, which tells me that Joseph's bones, right? Let this sink in, right? Joseph died, but he was never buried. Because again, they had to dig up and bury. No, but through historical research, it said his coffin laid above ground for 400 and something years until it was taken back to Canaan. Let's think about this, right? He spoke. This didn't happen to 400 years later. He said, God is going to visit you all. But he didn't, God didn't visit to 400 years. But these words were rehearsed throughout centuries. Throughout centuries, Joseph said, God is going to visit us. The people went from being comfortable to a Pharaoh that came up who did not know Joseph, enslaved the people of God for all this time, brought forth a deliverer in Moses. And I'm not going to go too far with Moses. God uses Moses with the 10 plagues. <laughs> And Pharaoh says, let him go. And the Bible said he gave them instruction to take his coffin. They had to go and get his coffin, right? And carry it. Wow. And that was a reminder that God has spoken this all these years. Even when it looked like it, it wasn't going to come to pass. Because these individuals were enslaved. But God is a God who cannot lie. God will do what he said. It may not come when we want him. But we're going to want him when he comes. We want our deliverance yesterday. We want God promise to have promises yesterday. God might be telling us, you may have to deal with your issue for 10 years, or like the woman with the issue of blood for 12 years, or like the woman who was bent over for 18 years. You just have to believe 
If God said that you're healed, you're going to get healed. If God said you're going to make it out, you're going to make it out. If God said he's going to deliver you. He's going to deliver you. We just have to believe. <clears throat> Amen. Y'all, we're going to conclude uh, Bible study lesson at that juncture. Uh, we'll, what we'll do, we'll finish the rest of chapter 11 next week. I'm going to give y'all some announcements. Uh, for those of you who like to give to Encouragement Temple, um, we do have the PayPal available on the feed. And we ask you all to, if you're giving electronically, uh, be able to give to Encouragement Temple. Um, we ask you all to follow us on, on Facebook, YouTube, and Instagram. Connect with us. Follow us. On April the 14th, the second Sunday in this month, we'll be celebrating six years of ministry. Amen. 60 years of ministry. Thank God for being able to sustain um, uh, uh, sustain ministry for the glory of God. Um, the, Pat, the Reverend Dr. Darrell Broussard of the Greater Pure Light Church will be our guest speaker on that Sunday morning at 10 a.m. For those of you in the city of Houston, y'all come out and worship with us, celebrate with us as God has been kind uh, to us. Uh, this Sunday coming it will be the first Sunday in the month of April. We we acknowledge birthdays and anniversaries. Um, uh, it is um, our first Sunday where we also uh, give communion, our memorial service. So we ask you all those who will be watching virtual with us that you have some uh, crackers and grape juice on standby throughout the virtual scene. Uh, for those of you who are coming into the temple to worship with us, let's come in, in a celebratory fashion, celebrating what the Lord has done for us. Again, we celebrated Resurrection Sunday. We've celebrated Good Friday. Let's keep the celebration going. Let's keep that momentum going, uh, expecting the move of God to take forth. Um, for those of you who are giving into the offering, if you don't do electronically uh, and you do want to uh, support Encouragement Temple, you can mail your contributions to Encouragement Temple. Uh, 4714 FM 1960 West. Suite 103, Houston, Texas, 77069. And also for those of you who who are designing prayer, uh, have any prayer requests, we ask y'all to uh, leave it in the chat, but also um, we are off the feed. You can also leave us an email uh, of your prayer request. Uh, and, and as the lesson said, by faith, we believe that God will do just what he said if it's in his will. Uh also, I worship Sunday morning, Opportunity Sunday. We worship Sunday morning at 10 a.m. So we'd love for y'all to come in and worship with us in person. But those are all our announcements. So what we're going to do, we are going to pray of the offering. And then we'll, we will dismiss from this virtual platform. Uh, let us play. Let us pray. I'm sorry. Oh, Lord, our God, we come before you. We thank you, Father. We thank you for your lesson, God. We thank you for all you've done for us, God. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for expanding our minds, God, of what your word says. Now, Father, we ask you, God, to bless those who are giving in this offering, Father. For those who have the desire to give, God, but not the means, Father, we ask you, God, to open the door, God, for them to be able to give. Give them gainful employment that they may give to the ministry, God. But for those who are giving into this offering and sowing the seed to encouragement temple, God, Father, I ask you to, to send them a blessing, God. Bless them financially, God. Bless them spiritually. Bless them physically, God. Bless them 30. Bless them 60. Bless them 100-fold. And Father, we ask you, God, let the gifts that are received, God, be used to the upkeeping and the building of your kingdom. And Father, we bless and we thank you right now. And Father, I ask you, God, to be with those who are with us for Bible study, God, those who view us online, those who will view the replay later, God, that you open the door for them, God, that you keep them, God, that you that you bless them abundantly. And God, we thank you right now. And we ask these in Jesus Christ's name. And we say amen. Amen. You all, so again, we'll see you all uh, this Sunday morning at 10 a.m. for worship. To then, for those of you online, we want y'all to be encouraged. And we'll see you this Sunday. God bless. <laughs>